most sports fans, it's what they've seen that stays with them. The replay in their minds. But not in Buffalo. In this town, the triumphant moments, the unforgettable excitement, the did that really just happen ecstasy, it's all tied to what we heard. Hockey in Buffalo became art on a spoken canvas. Pretty sweet moment to, to be a part of. When I hear his call, I still get chills. You reaffirmed our faith and turned a simple rhyme into a christening. I'm identified by that one moment. The day I die, they're gonna play the Rick Jenneret's voice and call, and everybody will smile and they'll toast Rick Jenneret because it's unbelievable. No, there's no one else who could have told our story quite like you. Rick would genuinely get excited and his face would get red and you could just hear the anticipation building he could ramp up into a fever and all of a sudden the call comes it's exciting it's addictive he made a game so exciting that you couldn't turn it off he has the ability to take the magnificent and turn it timeless every fan every player in the arena knows the moment isn't complete until they discover your call listen to his call and the excitement's always there it's the passion the spontaneity the joy the goosebumps the humor and the countless youtube searches there's the top 10 rj calls and i made it onto a couple of them i remember sending it to all my friends just the way he calls it it's going to be a memory in their mind forever you know those are the best times of, of my life but really it's the man the beating heart of Sabres hockey. The minute that headset goes on, he's there. He sounds like he's 30 years old again. It's always the same. A big smiling face staring at you. They broke the mold, man. He's the guy. RJ is, to the truest sense of the word, one of a kind. He is every bit the Sabre of all time. And he said, this building is bedlam. And he was the happiest ever. He feels like it's home. Your name will hang in the rafters. Top shelf! But your voice will echo forever. If they carry me to heaven on a chariot of ice, just make sure that you wrap me in your love before I die. And bury me in flowers. When I go, I want to bloom and come back as the color of a lovely afternoon. Through the doubt and pain and howling rain, I pray I'll always have the strength to say, hallelujah, anyway. I often say that Rustin Kelly is my favorite artist, and those lyrics were shared by him. But the truth is, RJ, is the greatest artist I've ever known. Vivid pictures in our mind, exceeded only by his unparalleled enthusiasm for the moments, and always delivered with the most perfect choice of words. Today, we are remembering RJ, the man behind the mic. Welcome, everyone. I'm Brian Duff. Um, it is an honor to be with you here today, and we would like to begin our celebration of RJ with Buffalo's own, the general manager of the Buffalo Sabres, Kevin Adams. Well, hello, everyone. It's amazing to be here tonight to get the chance to celebrate the life and career of the one and only Rick Jenneret. I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome Sabres fans, RJ fans, and I want to have a, say a special welcome to our alumni. I guess it's a bit uh, fortuitous that uh, the alumni tournament is scheduled for tomorrow, so a number of these guys are in town, because there's just a connection between everyone that's worn the great Buffalo Sabres sweater and Rick Jenneret, the voice that goes along with that. So welcome back, guys, and I'm sure as the night goes on, everybody's going to enjoy hearing from you and some of the stories you'll tell. On behalf of the organization and for all of us that work here, we're so fortunate every day to walk around and get to spend time with RJ. He would come in the office, he'd make us laugh, he'd tell stories. Um, 
give you a hard time sometimes, tease you, put you in her place. He was pretty good at that. But if I, if I had to say one thing that probably all of us would take away the most would be the word passion. The passion for his craft, the passion for this organization, the passion for the city of Buffalo and this community. And we will honor that every single day moving forward as, as we uh, go towards our quest of the Stanley Cup. So that's something that's really special. And on a personal note, RJ had just such a big impact on my life, and I'm so thankful to have this time to be able to stand up here and talk about that. I'm sure like many other people here in the crowd or watching on TV or listening on the radio, I would skate on my pond in the backyard, and I would announce the games as I would play. And generally, I was Gilbert Perot picking up the puck behind the net and going end in, scoring an amazing goal, and of course, announcing it at the top of my lungs, like RJ would do. And I was born in 1974, so the 80s for me is when I really became a true passionate hockey fan and a truly a passionate Sabres fan. And that's because of that voice. That's because of RJ. And during the week, my parents would send me to bed, yet I had to get up early for school. And inevitably, my mom would come up to the room and say, Kevin, why aren't you asleep? And I'd say, how do you fall asleep to Rick Jenneret calling a game? He could make a dump in from the red line sound just as exciting as a scoring chance in overtime. And that really sums up RJ, right? He could pull you out of your seat, you could close your eyes and feel that you were at the game even if you weren't there. And what a gift he had and what a gift to all of us that we were able to share for so many years. So I'm so thankful for that and excited for what the night Brings. And I'm also excited that through the course of my life, as I've gotten older here and gotten to know RJ, I was able to tell him that, what a big impact he had on me personally. So our owner, Terry Pagula, was unable to be here today, uh, just with some travel and some logistics, but he wanted to call in and he wanted to share uh, his thoughts um, and a story or two um, in his words. So. I'm going to uh, get Terry on the phone here, and we're going to listen. So go ahead, Terry. Okay, thanks, Kevin. We all miss Rick, but none of us will forget him. I remember how quietly Rick used to make his way through the Key Bank Center and around our offices, but with a mic in his hands and a mic in front of him, oh my, could he command a moment get everyone's attention, and paint a masterpiece with words. Rick helped me become a Sabres fan also, Kevin. The night we raised his banner at Quebec Center, at the end of the ceremony, I saw him stuff his speech notes into his pocket. I asked him, Rick, can I have a copy of your notes from tonight? He reached into his pocket and said, here, you can have the original. I don't know why the heck you would want them. I guess you just didn't understand, huh? He was a legend. On July 30th, I received my last text from Rick. For information, July 30th was the last day that Kim, was, was the day that Kim attended Bill's practice at St. John Fisher. The news broke and Rick texted me immediately. And I quote his text, it said, nicest news I've seen in ages. Godspeed to Kim and your family. 18 days later, we lost Rick. Yet in his last days, he graciously thought of my family and our well-being. Am I glad I became a fan and asked for his notes that night? Thanks for the memories, Rick, and Godspeed to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I'm sure those words uh, resonate with everybody in this building and watching on TV. I, uh, I want to bring up Rob Ray to uh, have a little message from the uh, Jenneret family. So thank you, everyone. Uh, this message is obviously from the Jenneret family. Words are inadequate, but the Buffalo Sabres organization, we wish to say to you, Thank you so much. How do we express our extreme gratitude and unwavering support, the love for Rick? Not just for this event today, 
but for every day during the last now 53 years. Thank you to the alumni for coming out today, sharing your stories about RJ. We have felt the love for many years, but the outpouring of well wishes over the last week have taken us all back. Rick lived a tremendous and rewarding life. He wouldn't have been able to do what he did for so long if he didn't have the community support of Buffalo in his corner. His and our respect for the support cannot be put into words. We are all invited to be there with you today, but the plain truth is, it's too soon, we can't, we're hurting. To all Rick's friends from near and far and around the world who have shared their condolences in all shapes and forms since the passing, we thank you. The flood of well wishes was and continues to be overwhelming, while at the same time, Comfort would be reminded about the tremendous impact he had on so many. For us, he was so much more than a hockey broadcaster. He was dad, bro, papa, and honey boy. How blessed we are that we can now open up our computer, see and hear him in all his glory whenever we want to. The question we're most often asked about him, what was he like in real life? Is he as excited and exciting? Does he do play-by-play -play of daily activities? Like, and here comes Cupcake, dipsy doodling down the stairs, she lands, she scores. And the answer to that question is no. Rick was, believe it or not, a very quiet and private man. He was devoted to his family and grand brats. No matter where we would go, there would always be someone who wanted a picture or an autograph. Rick was always happy to give his fans the attention that they deserved and always took time with them. When the kids were little, people would always stop him on the street and say, and they couldn't understand why they would ask for pictures and signatures. He was, after all, just Papa. Once while driving in the car, a very young brand brat noticed a booklet of headshots of Papa. Hey, look, can I have one? When we went into the house, we gave them a pen and said, go over and say to Papa, can I have your autograph? Knowing full well that the autograph was just a new unknown word. Papa, can I have your autograph? Rick signed the photo and the three-year-old watched, got it back and said, well, you weren't supposed to color on it. <laughs> As they grew up, of course, they knew that he was to the world much, much more than their grandfather. He had, he had his audience, but he was the audience of their lives, going to every ball game, every hockey game, every recital, every everything. He liked hamburgers and beer. He was an avid reader, enjoyed watching sports. He loved it when he would drive down the street and see a group of kids playing road hockey and hearing someone trying to be Rick Jenneret doing the play-by-play -play for the group. We have seen firsthand his love for this community for this organization, for the city of Buffalo, and the best fans in the world. We feel your love for him every second since August 17 has been a rapid succession of memories and tributes, a nonstop reminder of his on-air talent and his off-air sincerity. He left his mark. He doesn't just live on in us, he will live forever, live on in you. And she adds, we'll see you at the home opener. Thank you.
on. He has enough to keep his head away from it as far as he can. As the officials are trying to get in there and break it up. You're right in there, Razier. You're right between them, and Ruff is trying to get in there. Maybe kill the mics down there, guys, at the moment. And our man, Rob Ray, is right between them. He's getting an earful. At what point did you calm down and were able to hear RJ's call of all that for the first time, Lindy Ruff? <laughs> you know, I don't know if, if I calmed down. So I... <laughs> Until we thoroughly beat the shit out of everybody. <laughs> um, even RJ's call, it, it looked like Marty won that fight. <laughs> and, and I think the one thing about RJ, uh, you know, even games that uh, I coach and listen to the game uh, back, you, you'd listen to the game, don't think you play very well. By the time I listened to RJ, usually we played a pretty good game, so I felt a lot better about it. <laughs> so you're saying you had a hand in uh, your longevity behind the bench, perhaps. I, I really think he did because... <laughs> And there's a few scouts here, like Terry Martin scouting, other guys are scouting. And a lot of times scouts, they listen to the broadcast and they hear how good the team is playing. So they go back and say, holy crap, this guy's team is really playing well. When we weren't really playing well, but RJ did a hell of a job showing us up. Uh, he certainly did. Uh, folks, it is so great to have Lindy Ruff, James Patrick, Don Granado here as we celebrate and remember the man behind the mic. James, sources say you have a story to tell that you want to be the first to have the opportunity to tell today. No, I, um, <laughs> I think a lot of the tributes uh, the last, uh, last week or so have, have talked about RJ and you know, his passion for the game, his, his love of the game, how down to earth he was. Um, when I came here, I'd, I'd heard his iconic calls um, got to know him a little bit as a player, but um, my seven years as an assistant coach, um, RJ sat behind me on the bus and on the plane um, with Jim Lorenz and Harry Neal. And uh, um, one thing I'll, I'll never forget, probably three or four times a year, you'd be on the road and you'd have a really bad loss. And um, Lindy doesn't take those losses very good. <laughs> and so you could... Uh, you could hear a pin drop on the bus. And about five minutes into their drive to the airport, you'd hear this click, swoosh. And I'd turn my head and RJ was opening his beer. <laughs> and, and he would, and I was terrified to, that Lindy's gonna hear this, and he would just, he would look at me and he would just uh, cheers me and uh, had this big uh, youth, useful grin on his face. So um, I'll never forget that. And, uh, um, he win or loss, lose. He loved the game. That's that's one. He loved being around the players. He loved being around the team. Absolutely, Don. Uh, welcome. It's uh, great to see you. We're obviously uh, very much looking forward to this this new season. We don't have to say much right now. You know what the anticipation is like for this coming year, and 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 now we're you know we're celebrating RJ, and we will celebrate RJ throughout this coming season. What was your introduction to RJ like when you came on board here with this team? Yeah, special. But, but first of all, I, I have to say thanks for clapping after Lindy sitting here because he deserved lots of, lots of applause, and that was, that was fun to see the, the whole video there. So, um, yeah, yeah, RJ, I, I, when I reflect back uh, on RJ and, and I hear stories uh, like James just said, and, and the last couple of years, it really seemed this was an organization that needed some mentorship, and he filled a role with mentorship. He was incredible to me. I can remember coming here first as an assistant coach, and I went through a period of hospitalization. I was in the hospital for, for a couple of weeks, and when I came out and looked at my phone, one of the first messages when I got home was RJ, and I really hadn't met RJ to that point, but the message was, very kind. I, I've, you know, gone through texts that, that uh, the last couple of weeks now that he sent to me with 
with a lot of messages of, of uh, mentorship. And, you know, he, I think he had such a tremendous perspective through his career. Uh, I said a couple weeks ago, I felt that getting to know him more and more, he, he easily could have run an organization with his wisdom and the way he carried himself, the way he treated people. He, he, uh, what he did for our group in the last couple of years was he, he's a walking, he was a walking inspiration. He, he really had a great feel for the room, the mood, uh, and he inspired our group and our players uh, that they could do more. Uh, and, and you could see him deliver that message as he walked through underneath or he jumped on a plane with us or a bus with us. Uh, and it was very powerful to watch it with our team. And uh, we have a lot of our coaching staff here. Uh, I know it was very powerful to them as well. So, um, you know, I didn't share the, the, the memories that were seen on the video uh, quite as much. We did have some great ones with uh, his last call and uh, uh, and his last, his last call and, and the banner raising nights were amazing uh, in their own right. But the, the history he brought to our team, um, it definitely made our group and myself want to be a Buffalo Sabre. When, when you were around RJ as a player, like was, give us a sense of what maybe it's like around the dressing room, around the coach's room a couple hours before a game. And was RJ always just kind of around? Even do you remember that as a player, or only more when you were coaching? Well, I I remember uh, you know a lot more of it, uh, the coaching part of it. I think uh, a good part of my career playing for Scotty Bowman, we all kind of tiptoed around. <laughs> uh, so I think RJ kind of tiptoed around too a little bit. But you know, Don has made some great points. Um, he he was an infectious guy to be around. Uh, I don't know if, if RJ ever had a bad day. Uh, you know, we had plenty of bad days as coaches or as players. And going back to the playing days, um, I don't know where our games on TV have I played so long ago, it might have just been radio. <laughs> so, anyways, the, uh, the RJ I saw as a player, uh, and then the RJ I got to know as a coach, uh, really totally different. Uh, you could talk to RJ. Uh, in the hotel, by the hotel bar. Um, we could talk about the game last night. We could talk about another team that played. I would like to talk to him about his calls, you know, and I, I would even ask him sometimes, like, how long have you had that call in your pocket, you know, like, like Larry Playfair scoring a goal, you know? <laughs> he had that in his pocket a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but almost as long as when I scored too, so I can't criticize Larry. Right. Uh, but he'd just say, you know, the calls came to him. I, I always thought, you know, he had this drawn up, is this guy scoring a goal? Um, you know, here's the call that's coming, but he had this knack that everything just came to him. Uh, an, in, an incredible amount of calls where, and I've said this, that I hardly ever as a coach like to listen to the volume uh, when I'm going through a game. You know, turn the volume down, go through the game, go through the system, you know, pick your clips. But when we're listening to our broadcast, listen to RJ, turn the volume up. And we would share it. I know James, you know, we would sometimes, you know, yell from office to office, go, did you hear RJ's call? Uh, did you hear the call on that play or, you know, that goal or that penalty? Uh, it, it was an unbelievable presence that, you know, you felt when you listened to a, a lot of his calls. Did you feel that too when you were yeah, definitely, definitely. scouting the opponents? Like, um, or, you know, I like loved, going through the tape and, yeah. You do watch hour after hour after hour of, of video when, you, when you're coaching. Uh, I mean, early mornings and, and, uh, and some late nights doing it, it, it keeps you awake. That's, I mean, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm one of the first coaches to start nodding my head after a while, but um, when, I had, uh, when I coached the Sabres, I just had RJ up up loud and that kept me awake and um, I mean the other thing I did want to add that he was always so positive when I'd see him after a game you'd see him on the bus or the plane and even the rough ones he would just say well that wasn't too bad or, or you know <laughs> we'll get him next game like he was never negative about the team and um, I mean I think as a, I think as a player you felt that and definitely as a coach. 
It's impressive, isn't it, Don? I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think of how he maintained that level. I think, was it, was it you last week when we were talking where, did you use the word stable when talking about Arch? Because he's just, he was just so consistent and, and every, you know, it didn't matter in what situation you were with him. He was always just, you knew exactly what you were getting. And that must be kind of comforting when you're living in the, I don't know, the tension of going into a game or having conversations about a game that maybe didn't go well after the fact. It was. It was just to add on, as I would, as I mentioned, he did take a mentorship role. So he'd stroll by our office and kind of peek in, and get a feel for the mood. Or we, do we have our heads down? Are we not talking? Are we in our computers? And he had a knack of, of just saying the right things and just leaving the room a better place than, than when he walked in. Um, and and again, I just you you the, when I think of him, the pride that he. We're all proud that all of us that love the Buffalo Sabres for different reasons, we're all proud that he was a Buffalo Sabre. And, and I think that he, if there's anything that adds to the mystique of, of our organization, uh, he's it. The, the, the entire history of the Buffalo Sabres and, and you know, his, his voice and the memories he created are out there forever. Uh, and they just draw people to, 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 to be attentive to what we do. And, and it, he was so, he just seemed so at peace with the stress we had day to day uh, that you, you knew you were, you, you were around a legend and it was fun to be around him. What was your family's uh, reaction to RJ when, like early on in your career when, and it would have been hard then for them to get access to the games, but at some point they must have learned what it sounded like RJ calling the games and, and you being a player here. Well, I think, uh, we're all evident of all you know, all his great calls, yeah. and I think that you know, a couple of my boys played and um, you know watched a lot of hockey at home. Uh, kids weren't that old when I you know I, I was done playing, so they didn't get to see a, a big part of that. But um, you know, even my kids, you know, could come up with some of the calls. Yeah. You know, some of RJ's calls. Uh, he's made us. RJ's made us all better. I know he made me, first he made me a better person because he really, he really didn't have a bad day. Um, he made me a better coach. I know Don, he's probably, he's made you a better coach. You just mentioned that. And I, and I will say this, Don has done one hell of a job here with the Sabres. And, and I know, and I know one thing for sure, RJ is proud of the job you've done, and you. You, you put the work in, you get the results, and, and and RJ, RJ will be with you all this year. He'll be there. He'll be he'll be there helping you. So, uh, we thank you. Thank you. When you were so close to winning. How do you remember RJ in those moments? Uh, you, you know, again, uh, you, you could sense, you know, his disappointment. We were disappointed that in a couple of situations. You could sense his disappointment. And I've, and I've said the, one of my biggest disappointments was not being able to give RJ that Stanley Cup call. You know, like the Sabres are Stanley Cup champions. I, I can't imagine what that call would have been like or what that goal would have been like or how Rick would have portrayed the whole event. But, you know, to me, I think you're looking at something that would have been spectacular to hear, uh, probably to see him. Uh, but he was, he was like the rest of us. He, he felt the pain of a loss. He just didn't show it like maybe like I showed it because sometimes I was a little bit a little bit hard on myself and other people <laughs> uh, so that's the only disappointment is not giving Rick and God bless you Rick uh, not giving that Stanley Cup call well said Don you talk so much about uh, you know mentorship 
did you have any little moments behind the scenes that you really cherished with RJ or that you, that you witnessed your players having with RJ? And it could be anything, really something innocent and simple, but you know might have a lasting impact on You, you know, I, I could never do it justice because his humor was spot on. Uh, like I said, he could shift the room with his humor and, and just change the mood. Uh, and he did, and, and I couldn't do it justice, but just he'd do it in his own way, and, and it was pure RJ, it seemed, as I got to know him better and better. Um, but so, so lots of little moments like that. But he did speak to the team after games uh, on both occasions uh, that we had uh, nights of celebration for him. Uh, and then he came in a couple of other times, and I asked him uh, to, to walk down to the locker room with me and, and take over. And, and um, our players loved it. I think Alex Tuck, lots of our guys have spoken since. And, and you, can, you, you can sense that, um, that, that there's a loss there that we all have that we're not so sure how to even react or feel um, or what it's going to be like. And I do uh, like what Lindy said. Uh, he, he, he's a big part of all of us moving forward. Um, I know when the guys get here from training camp, those stories are going to really start to flourish as we go through camp. I just know that, knowing our group, when they get together uh, and they don't see him walking around, uh, we're all going to miss him on, on that first day and all the way through, there's no question. Well, to the point that you said you probably couldn't do it justice trying to maybe paraphrase something you said, uh, the captain, Kyle Oposo, did say recently that, you know, it was kind of maybe just after the season ended or was trending in that way. and he had a moment with Kyle in like the training room. He's like, sure, now you get good. I'm retiring, you know? Yeah. So he was, he was always quick to, to make that. And he did it with everyone. It didn't matter where in this arena, you know, every department, everywhere you went, he was able to connect with people. So I would ask you this before we wind down this uh, panel. Um, one word to describe Rick Jenneret. Unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. James? Um, it's hard with one word, but I just say I uh, had no ego. Mm, nice. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you a word that I don't know if it's a word, but synergistic. <laughs> 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 the synergy that he had was just, ama just incredible. Amazing. Just incredible. Gentlemen, thank you. It's not just the voice, it's the person. And it's probably the reason his voice is so memorable. It's, uh, there's a, such a realness behind it. It's real emotion, it's real connection. You remember the voice, but then you get to know him. And he's a, you know, just a sweet, caring person with uh, a great sense of humor. And um, it was always great to spend time with him. And I was lucky I got to come back uh, and see him you know, a couple times in the last year. And, and that was important to me to uh, include him in, in my time coming back. So that was, that was nice. Sandfield, Sandfield in front to Martin, he shoots, right on the credit, and he scores! Sandy Gare! Sandy Gare! Sandy Gare has the sister of the favorite Kyle Osterman! Gare works in the rebound! Get it to Presley, gets it again! Daw, charging after it, clear right out in front! Backhand by Hannon, he scores! Dave Hannon finally put away the backhand!
Danny Gare, Dave Hannon, Brad May, Rip Simonic. What a cast. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Overtime heroics for all three of you and RJ and Ripper, the only ones to see all of it this whole time. <laughs> Ripper, what do you think when you hear your good friend RJ with those classic calls? As I said many times, my unfortunate remembrance is not being to hear him on the radio or TV, but I listened to him a thousand times. And after we got in the locker room, RJ was down in the locker room congratulating Brad May, Dave Hannon especially because he had to wait all that time to have a beer after the game. <laughs> and tickets, he also scored a great goal against Montreal. So as long as I'm still alive, he's in my heart. Well, this is, uh, this is quite a collection of historic moments and the authors of them. Uh, Brad, you have spoken many times on how that call changed your life. Um, what do you say about it now as we are here celebrating the life of RJ? Well, first of all, um, it's so nice to see uh, all these people out in support and, of course, in memory of, of Rick. Um, as a young player coming into the Buffalo Sabres organization was a dream come true. RJ was on the bus with us and he would, you know, obviously traveled and um, it, he was such a joy to, to, and a great conversation when you came on to the bus or on an airplane. Um, he always had a, you know, a few choice words if you had a good game or a bad one. Um, but there's no question, I think I've said it and I'm sure everybody in attendance, um, there's a lot of wonderful memories and names and players that have come through this, this organization, but nobody as influential and as, um, as much of a statesman for the Buffalo Sabres in Western New York as Rick Jenneret. I think, um, obviously, Gilbert, I mean, he's the legend we all look up to, um, but along with Gilbert, I think Rick Jenneret is and what has been for 51 years, the face and certainly the voice of the Buffalo Sabres and um, just really, really don't take it for granted at all. He was a wonderful guy to be around. I got to work with him in the broadcast booth as well after my career and um, we, we're, we're gonna miss him. He's a wonderful guy. Was he harder on you as a player or as a fellow broadcaster? Oh, in the broadcast booth for sure because <laughs> All he, every day he would, he would rip me and, um, and then he had a great, his running mate, Rob Ray, and, and of course Rob doesn't you know, ever shy away from that stuff, but RJ, RJ was a special, special guy and it's sad to sit here, and, but it's so beautiful to see everybody else, but um, to actually speak about him, um, it's quite an honor and, and thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, how long was it until, like, when did you actually hear the call of the quadruple overtime winner against the New Jersey Devils in 1994? This is sort of, we talked earlier in the week before I come up, so, you know, huge goal, obviously. Uh, it was game six against New Jersey. We had to go back, you know, to win game seven, and like, like Lindy said, when he was here, playing and after when he coached, but we, we had a pretty good team. And uh, we went into New Jersey and unfortunately we lost that game 3-1. I missed another open net, so after that goal I scored in game six. So, you know, over the years, I, I told RJ this last year, I said, it took me probably six months to watch the game. And my kids, I live in Pittsburgh now, and they came down and I didn't even think of it, but my son says, Dad, can I watch it and stay up? I said, yeah. My other boy said the same thing. My daughter did. My wife went upstairs to watch another, something else. She wasn't too interested. <laughs> and probably five and a half hours after, everybody's sleeping except me, and I'm looking at the TV listening to RJ, because, you know, that, it, it really, for me, and I'm sure Brad would agree, it was a big goal in our careers. It's sort of, 
you know, I love Buffalo and the fans and meeting the alumni. It's, it's a tremendous place, and, and I watch every year now with Don Granado. I want them to, to win that cup. But so I texted RJ after this happened, and the funny part was is he said, well, don't worry, I'll send you another copy of the game. You know what I mean? It was, it was pretty cool. So great memories. That is amazing. Danny, boy, what an incredible relationship yeah. um, for decades and decades with RJ. Um, how would you describe how that relationship, friendship evolved and uh, some of your earliest memories from his great calls and then yeah. being able to sit next to him and broadcast? No, as, as everybody has said here tonight and on the stage and you've seen it all week long, his, his passion for the game, which is um, exceptional. And uh, to be able to get a call on my 50th goal, Danny Gare, Danny Gare, Danny Gare, it was exceptional. But then have the ability, you know, after I was retired to work with him was um, a, a tremendous honor. So, and then when I retired, I got to watch him like you fans did as much on television and uh, didn't miss a beat, you know, I mean, throughout all those 51 years. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, a great, you know, time in my life. I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I you know, I, I look out and, um, and see all these people here, which sh shows you that Sabre Nation loved RJ and RJ loved you back. So. All right, let's get into the real off-ice stories now with RJ. You got any good ones, Danny? <laughs> I got two stories, okay, real quick. And I've said them before, but the one that I remember, two of them, I, my most memories of doing broadcast with him, one was in New York against the Rangers early in the season. It was my first year as a radio broadcaster, color guy next to RJ. We go into Madison Square Gardens and they were redoing the press box. So they had this makeshift table and little areas where we could sit with the gallery gods, the blues, the up and upper part of Madison Square Garden. So we had Archie on my left, engineer in the middle, and me on the right. And I've got all my notes all over the, all over the place. He had one that was the lineup blown up 10 times because he couldn't see. But, so as the game goes on early in the first period, Howard Chuck gets, gets, gets a goal to, and passes it to Andrew Chuck in, in, off to the side of the net and puts it in. But as that happened, a piece of my notes, one of my notes fell between his seats. So I go down like this, and I miss the goal. I miss the, my, one of my first goals with RJ. So I had a little monitor there, and I'm going, I look at the monitor on the replay. Uh, here's my call was, now watch, watch how Howard Chuck, see how he looks and he looks and sees Anderchuk, and Anderchuk, see how he finds the hole between the net miner. And he goes like this, they can't see. <laughs> or on radio. <laughs> the other one, the other one, which was, was, was quite a, you know, iconic call, obviously, like Brad May, Mayday. I was in the booth, this little tiny booth in the odd, and, later in the year and Pat LaFontaine was traded for Pierre Turgeon and Pat didn't score in the first period in the second period and it was like me RJ and Barry Butel who was our intermission host <laughs> LaFontaine scores so there's this quietness right in the booth and all of a sudden it's like this like hard against our chest shut up and then out of his mouth goes, la 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 <laughs> and years ago, when John Muckler was a GM, he liked having some rough, tough guys on the team. And, you know, he wanted to test their will and their power to back up his teammates. So Rob Ray's first year, unfortunately, he got an accident uh, on the S-curve in Delaware Park. And 
they got thrown out of the truck, him and Scotty Metcalf and a player by the name of Kevin Kerr. Scotty Metcalf ended up playing a few games for the Sabres, and he's a very, very good friend of ours. So on the plane, we fly to Greensboro, North Carolina. So we land, and he calls the three guys over, John Muckler, and he goes, you better be at your best and toughest tonight. So game starts, five minutes, bench clearing brawl. So the game took about four hours. So after the game, we had a Western boy on the team, Doug Huda. He says, well, we're staying over, so let's go to a country Western bar. So RJ goes, I'm not going to no bar. I'm going with Rip an equipment truck. <laughs> so we get an equipment truck. Here comes RJ with an 18 pack. <laughs> Three hour ride, I'm driving, RJ's in the passenger seat. So I'm driving 25 minutes, 30 minutes, six beer, 12 beer. Now we're getting low on beer and gas. So I'm saying now, I'm saying, you okay, RJ? Like, do I have to stop? Do I have to stop? No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, just keep going. I said, well, I have to stop for gas. I don't know if you have to pee, but I gotta stop for gas. And I'm going, this man has the biggest bladder I've ever seen in my entire life. So I'm in there, I'm at the pump, pumping the gas. So I'm saying, okay, I said, you all set RJ to relieve yourself? I goes, what's in the bag? Oh, you said 45 minutes to Richmond, so I got a 12 pack. <laughs> so in three hours, RJ drank 30 beers. So that puts him in my Hall of Fame. Uh. But one thing about RJ, he was always organized. There was a Sabres itinerary and there was RJ's itinerary. Yeah. I mean, we went everywhere. We went to Yankee games, we went to racetracks, we went to uh, uh, see David Letterman, but he always had a plan. And Robbie was fortunate when he started working with him that the connections we made, him and myself over the years, we really enjoyed each other's company. And he was that kind of guy. He could never, ever say no to anybody. And when he was in the public, he was a wonderful human being. And I can't thank him enough. Again, like I said, he's in my heart and he's in a lot of my stories. Hmm. So no better man for the Buffalo Sabres organization than RJ. Hey, Brad, what, uh, like, after the May Day call, like what happened, what changed in your life? What was the reaction like from family, friends, and then probably people beyond? Because didn't RJ love to just say, like, he, he's the one that kind of made you more famous? Well, <laughs> what he said about Brad May's goal was, he says, Maisie, I remember this in the locker room when he came in. <laughs> He says, I know you've been practicing that move for a long, long time. And Maisie goes, you're right. <laughs> so answer, answer, Maisie. <laughs> uh, for, for me, um, just going back to 1993, was my second season in the NHL. And um, I was in the playoffs and everything. Obviously, we were having a, a, a great run. We actually limped into the playoffs that year. We lost a bunch of games. And Boston was the best team at that time. And... Um, for me, my, it's been my nickname, um, it's my handle on whatever, all these different social media things, but um, I, I'm known as May Day because of RJ, and when he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, um, I was working in Toronto at the time, I was, I was there, and when he actually, I wanna say went up for the, it's the Elmer J. Ferguson Award, um, they actually played that call as he was walking up on stage, and. It was really, really, really special, obviously, to have that. RJ said, you know, there's no question. He goes, I got you that next contract. And to be honest, <laughs> our, <laughs> hey, I, I absolutely agree. It's the best call. Um, and, and he's just so amazing. And the, the way he would call fights and, and, of course, the history 
of, of the organization I came into. Um, you just knew this guy was special. And there's so many faces that he worked with. Jimmy, I mean, I was thinking of you and Rob the other day because I know how much time you guys spent with RJ. And when I was in the booth, and, or certainly um, on the broadcast team here for a few seasons, during afternoons in Minnesota, being one of them, Robbie, when, I don't know, it was like 11.30 in the morning, we meet for a late breakfast, and Robbie and I are we're, we're hailing down an Uber because we're gonna go see an afternoon matinee. That's one of the things that RJ loved to do was, was go see movies in the afternoon, and I'm on the road when I was playing. There was not even a chance you're thinking about going to see a movie, but you're doing the broadcast stuff and, and to be part of the group. It was so fun special times to be with him um, and of course he'd even call me May Day which was really cool and um, there's no doubt when it, we've heard the call we've heard all of his calls but um, for me as I age and other things happen um, it's going to be his voice that illustrates that wonderful moment and I'll never forget it and I'm, I'm eternally grateful um, to have known him but to have that moment that we can share together. Amazing. Danny, do you, have a, um, do you have any other personal memories from along the way, uh, either as a player um, or as a broadcaster? I, I think, you know, so much has been said about RJ, but I think the thing that, you know, he kind of kept quiet to himself or didn't expose himself or the no ego is what James said, you know, was important not only for his himself but I think for um, the community he 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 embraced you know he loved Buffalo and charities like I'd, I'd ask him to come to my golf tournament the charity golf tournament I do it was like nothing he would be there show up you know make his uh, appearance and then head out and he did that so many times uh, without people even acknowledging or he, himself getting any acknowledgement yeah. but he he just had that giving spirit, and I think, uh, you know, <laughs> and not only could he call games, but he had that impression of, you know, he was always, you know, he would embrace Buffalo, and that's what I, that's what I loved about him a lot, and, and he kept that kind of on the quiet side, which I, I, I really um, thought was pretty special. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe that's a good segue into the RJ fan club ripper. What, 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 is the, what was the RJ fan club? Well, as uh, many people didn't know, RJ was a bar owner. He owned a bar with Donnie Lever, Ricky Lee, and Harry Neal. It was called Clancy's. So uh, my wife, who was an avid Sabre fan, who I lost 10 years ago, but uh, we used to go over to the bar at Clancy's before RJ was popular. He was just the voice on the radio. So we would go over and one thing RJ did, he always wanted you to meet his friends. So, I mean, even in his days when he was failing at the end, when he came to the arena and we sat in the locker room and we talked, this is what kind of, this is why we started a little fan club. There was only 10 of us. It was my wife and my cousins and my nephews. And he would talk about Slush, his friend. Oh, Slush isn't doing that good, and, you know, I feel sorry for him. And since he has passed, so Sandra told me that he had passed away. But he would talk about Duke. They always would go to lunch at Chef's when he wasn't announcing a game. He always made his appearance at the rink. And the fondest thing about RJ was he got an opportunity, and Donnie Granado and, and uh, Kevin Adams know the players that are on this team today got to spend some time with him. Two years, and he is quite a legend, and he is one of the, one of the nicest human beings. The players just gravitated to him. It's like Danny said, Brad said, Dave Hannon said, RJ was a magnet. He was a magnet of positive attitude. He always thought about the best. No matter if you were a fourth line player, you were a seventh defenseman, you were a spare goalie, he would always be positive. Well, you'll have a better game. He would never ever criticize any player on their ability to play hockey because he loved the Sabres. And a lot of people 
that love him around the league, he could have many, many times, when the Sabres didn't make the playoffs, he could have went into national TV. But he was a Sabre announcer, and that's what he wanted to be known as. So he didn't want to be known as, oh, the guy that's going to, to call a Ranger game or a Montreal game or a Toronto game. RJ was the Sabres announcer, and he loved it. I'd say he ended up with the biggest fan club, really. I mean, this is, and we've seen that, thankfully, in the last couple of years to be able to honor him um, and then be able to celebrate him here today. Well, hey, they sold the bar, so we had to get rid of the fan club. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say it was impossible not to notice when you looked at the date of RJ's passing, and it was on August 17th, and it was mere hours before the 18th, which is the date we lost Dale Howarchuk a few years ago, and Danny, as someone who's in the Sabres Hall of Fame, like RJ, yeah. like Dale, it always struck me how much respect RJ had for Dale and how much of an honor it was for him to go into the Sabres Hall of Fame yeah. with Dale. And Brad, I know you'll speak on this in a moment too, yeah. but. That connection, that respect, I mean, it, it must be incredibly like strong when you feel that from someone, you know, who's been around the team as long as RJ has. Well, they were similar individuals. I mean, they were passionate about what they did. They cared about people. Um, Ducky was one of the easiest going guys in the world, you know. You guys know you were his teammate. I think you were, maybe. Um, I did, you know, work on TV back then, and, and RJ and him just connected. You're right. And I remember going to that Hall of Fame, and, and the luncheon that they had for RJ was exceptional. I mean, they were there for each other. Yeah. And that was a, a pretty cool thing for two Sabres to go into the, the Hockey Hall of Fame at the same day, and they, they both deserved it. What would you say about their connection and those two gentlemen, if we're sitting here talking about both? Well, they're both gone way too too young, too early. Yeah. And I tell you, I know RJ had a wonderful life. I get it. Dale passed away at 57, I believe. Um, it was devastating for, for all his teammates and, and, and the hockey community that knew Dale. But fantastic guy. I would say they're bo they were both curmudgeons <laughs> in their finest. Um, you know, they, they actually were a great conversation, and they brought brought it back to the the real um, both of them and they didn't let you off the hook if you're screwing around or full of shit or whatever you had to, whatever, whatever whatever was part of the story they would call you out on it and um, but I know they were very close um, I was really close with Dale um, at the end um, got, got a chance and I just every chance I get to speak of, of Dale Howarchuk every time I now get a chance to speak about Rick Jennerette um, I think you said it's it's in our heart, Rip, um, wonderful people, and I think that's the best part for us and all of us here is to remember those special people that we yeah. play a wonderful game that is a job, but um, it's all those relationships outside of it that make it extra special, and certainly everyone that's on the floor here, um, we're, we should be proud to, to, to represent such a wonderful organization, but a wonderful league and the great game of hockey. Um, and these guys are both in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yeah. The guys we were just speaking of, um, they're legends. They certainly are. One word, gentlemen, to describe Rick Jennerette. Danny, we'll start with you. One, one word to describe RJ. <laughs> it's been said before, passion. Dave? Buffalo. May Day. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've noticed up in RJ's booth, the blue light, but you know what's missing? The gold, RJ took it with him. Yeah. Gentlemen, outstanding. Thank you for the memories and God bless. Thanks. We'll continue right after this.
to have a game like that, what stands out to me is everything that happened after. You know, with RJ coming on the ice and being able to to have his moment. And we were sharing that moment with him. It wasn't the other way around. Like, that's his moment, and we were just able to be a part of it. When I presented him with that sword, it was, how do you sum up a man that has meant so much to, like I said, the entire hockey world, this community, this organization, you know, and it, I just wanted it to be about him. And I just want to let him enjoy that time and enjoy knowing that he has had such a big impact in the framework of our entire organization. And his banner will be up there for um, forever. And it's uh, it was a special night to be a part of. Okay, now we're back. I think most of you know, um, I don't talk glowingly about the Maple Leafs an awful lot, um, but in this case, <laughs> uh, it, really, it really is something to think of living in this area and being able to just tune in on the radio various sporting events, most specifically hockey and our proximity to Toronto and and it works both ways. I mean, I grew up east of Toronto and listened to nothing but Sabre games and when you're in the car around here, you hear the voices of the Sabres and the Maple Leafs and to think that between RJ and our next speaker, more than 90 years of NHL broadcasting. He is Maple Leafs legendary play-by-play -play man, Joe Bowen. Hi, everyone. It is a real honor to be here. I call this joint the Little Shop of Horrors. We're polite. Canadians are polite. We travel down the QEW, have a lot of people join us here in your wonderful facility, leave the two points and go home. <laughs> Far too often. I've been asked to represent the rest of the Broadcasters Association in the National Hockey League, and I can't tell you how very pleased and very honored I am to do just that for you this evening. We are a fairly small group with 64 home team broadcasters behind the microphones in the National Hockey League. And once we are admitted into that group, well, we tend to like to stick around. It's a pretty sweet gig if you can get it. And Rick Jenneret stuck around for 51 years. RJ was the dean of that fraternity group, the Foster Hewitt Award winner, Hockey Hall of Fame member. And as I mentioned, he worked for 51 seasons with his beloved Buffalo Sabres. By comparison, Foster Hewitt did 41 seasons broadcasting the Toronto Maple Leaf games. Pete Weber, who is unable to attend today, he is in Dublin, uh, Ireland, celebrating the Notre Dame Fighting Irish victory there yesterday. Yeah, I can go along with that. I'm a big Irish fan too. But Pete of the Nashville Predators wanted me to mention some of the wonderful partners RJ had in the booth. Many of them are here and many of them will be up here speaking and some have already done that. But I will mention them on behalf of Pete. Pat Hannigan, Mike Robitaille, Jim Lorenz, Larry Playfair, Danny Gare, Harry Neal, Rob Ray, all were uplifted by his passion for the broadcast and his intelligence and a way of incorporating their expertise into bringing you the best broadcast possible. And as Pete Weber quipped, it's too bad RJ was so laid back. 
God, I liked it when there was more fighting in this league, too, I got to admit. <laughs> Home team broadcaster. It brings with it a strange dichotomy of sorts. And Rob Ray, I'll explain what that word means. <laughs> it's a strange sort because certainly RJ was front and center and he was a homer. He was a homer. As if something was wrong with being just that. Every night, Rick Jenneret wanted the Buffalo Sabres to win that hockey game. He wanted to celebrate their success and his passion showed each and every night with each and every broadcast. Traveling with hundreds of young Buffalo players, they were all like family to him, and we're hearing stories of that as we go on with all of the people up here talking about the love that he had for all of them. He desperately wanted them to do well each and every night, but he would get frustrated with them at times, as we all do with our kids, and critical when it was warranted, I'm sure, but he never stopped loving this team and could hardly wait to sing their praises to the rafters in his own unique way and his own unique cadence. RJ was a homer and by God, ladies and gentlemen, he was damn good at it. R.J., when told many times that he was the voice of the Buffalo Sabres, would always correct that person making the statement that he wasn't the voice of the Sabres, that Ted Darling was the true voice of the Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> Ted was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1994, and we lost him in 1996 to Pick's disease. I'm pretty sure that the two Sabre broadcasters have had a few days now up there to chat, have copious amounts of beverage, <laughs> and reminisce. I'm sure that Ted in those conversations has told RJ that he would be proud and honored to share that title with him. Rick Jenneret is most certainly the voice of the Buffalo Sabres. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Ralph, my broadcast partner, and I will miss the cell calls, the text messages, when Rick might be sitting at home on a night off listening to two fools down in Toronto trying to entertain people. We dearly loved him. And Sandra and the Generet family, we can't thank you enough for sharing him with all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you for those incredible words, and uh, we're able to wind down our remembrance of RJ, the man behind the mic uh, tonight, with those who've worked closest with him in the booth. It is so great to see you, Jim Lorenz. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. <laughs> Rob Ray, Dan Dunleavy, Marty Baran, nice to see you. Jim, how do, you, how do you put into words the career of Rick Jenneret? Boy, um, unique, um, passionate has been used a number of times. He was born to do this job, no question in my mind. Um, his enthusiasm, his knowledge of the game, uh, the way he loved Buffalo, loved the fans. It, it was a remarkable ride uh, to be around him, to work with him. Uh, 
to listen to him all those years. And we have those headsets on, as Rob would attest, and uh, others who have done the job. He never got tired of listening to him. He uh, would forever amaze you, and you would say to yourself, where did that come from? And uh, he, never, he never prepared in the sense that uh, somebody mentioned the only thing he'd have was a lineup sheet, but it was all up here. He was one of the most brilliant minds that I've ever met. Uh, he would have excelled at any sport doing play-by-play -play, from golf to baseball uh, to NFL football, he was that good. And he was, had that incredible talent of being able to recognize the moment, grasp it, and then put it into words. I never seen anyone like him, and uh, I don't think there ever will be. What, what sports, what sports was he actually watching the most oh. when he was technically calling the hockey game? That's what, that's what we uh, need right. to know, because my well, guess Jimmy, is... Jimmy could probably attest here. He'd be in the booth, he'd have the horse race here, he'd have a basketball game there, he'd have the golf there, and baseball down here. And calling the game, right, Jimmy? Yeah. And he would never make a mistake, and then he'd all of a sudden hit you and point you at something <laughs> that just happened on the TV. <laughs> and I was like, how the hell are you doing that? Like, I can't even... But he was, he was a master at it, yes. He's, he was... Uh, as I said, one of a kind, unique, and you know he loved uh, he loved the fans here in Buffalo, and the fans loved him. And I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, he's so beloved, and he set such a high standard for himself. That must have been a burden for him to carry, uh, because he didn't want to disappoint the fans. He didn't want to let anybody down. And so every game, he had to be at his best. And if he wasn't, then he would have thought, well, I let the fans down. But you know, in all the years that I did games with him, and there were so many, he never disappointed. He always was able to, to grasp the moment and describe it the way it should be, as only he could describe it. Yeah, and you know what, uh, Jim, to your point, there were moments on the bus where I would come up and I would sometimes struggle to find what to talk with about with a legend of a craft you yourself are trying to get a handle of. And there'd be games where I'd be listening, I'd be uh, doing interviews or whether, you know, when Rick's calling the game and I think, that was a great game. I mean, he brought that to life. That's classic RJ. And we're talking obviously in later years. So I'd see him on the plane on the bus and I'd come over and I'd go, hey, Great call tonight, but to your point, he'd look at me and he'd say, no, nope, could have been better. Yeah. And I think that was something that not everybody heard because they heard greatness. But you talked about the bar for Rick Jenneret. That bar is up there somewhere with him right now. <laughs> so uh, that's what he said. Marty, when I, I look across at you and think to like nine days ago, um, when we started our show after Rick's passing, and your first words were remembering the man. Mm -hmm. So we're here remembering the man behind the mic, but that was literally the first thing because we had already talked, you know, or I painted the picture of his career, but you really just wanted to dive in immediately on the man himself. Well, the thing about RJ is that I was lucky to have dinner with him about 35 times a year. You know, a few years back, we used to always have dinner with the media group right underneath here. And there was a table reserved for RJ and a chair reserved for RJ. And I remember my first time I grabbed my food and I sat like five tables over. Yeah. And RJ looked over, he's like, hey, over here, over here. This is our group, right? But every night you would see broadcasters, uh, journalists, coaches from other teams, players from other teams come in and want to talk to RJ and share the stories. And I feel like I got an education in the league, the NHL, by listening to RJ tell those stories. It was incredible. I mean, the fact that he, and you guys have all mentioned this, he didn't come up with stats and notes. He didn't put them in front of him. It was all up here. When he called the game, and that's what other people from other 
broadcasts and other teams love coming to talk to him because it wasn't a painting by numbers, right? It was, he had a masterpiece. And it was all up here. When he saw the game, he was able to describe it and paint that beautiful picture. Um, so that if you were listening to McGilney left a vapor trail, you knew, you, you could see a vapor trail by an Alex McGilney skating through the middle, right? When I made a save, you know, he would say, oh, what a glove save. And then you would listen to the other team's broadcast. And it was like, well, Biron got lucky on that one. Like it was... <laughs> There was always a picture that he wanted to paint, and uh, so that was the broadcast side, but obviously getting to have dinner with him, and he would talk about his, as Razor said earlier, the grand brats, and you know, I remember when his grandson broke his leg, and he was, he was so proud of showing the picture of his grandson still doing the, the paper route while in a wheelchair with his leg way up, right? And he was like d throwing the papers out, and he was, sh he was so proud of sharing that with all of us. And that was the man, the, the proud family man that we got to meet. All right. Were any of you ever intimidated by him? <laughs> uh, very uh, first yes. day. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dad. You know, I, he I still week. am, by the way. Yeah. Okay, just putting that out there. <laughs> but then you got the one text from RJ that he gave you a compliment, right? Like one of the last texts that I got could from Could you him. tell if it was a compliment? Well, you could, <laughs> but, but there was always another text that came in right after. So... Like, it was probably March last year. He was at home probably watching the game. And he texted me, wow, you're, you're getting pretty good at this. But then the next text was, you're also looking very old. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so like, wow, I'm getting a text from RJ. And then I was like, yeah, well, there and, it is. And to that point, Rob, you can speak to this because it happened obviously last year too. How much he loved the Sabres you already know he watched every single moment, and Razor, I would turn to look at him, Rob would be on his phone while the game is going on, I'm like, what are you doing over there? And again, like RJ watching another sport, Razor's on his phone, <laughs> he says, what were you doing over there? Well, RJ's texting me, he says, we got to be better. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't talking about the team, he was talking about us. So. Yeah, you know what, I... I when you talk about being intimidated, I was scared to death of the man when I, not when I played, but when I started doing this job, because everybody talks about it being a perfectionist, and he really was. And he didn't do it in a mean way, I think, but it was like, all of a sudden you'd go to commercial, and he'd push the button so he could talk to you, and he'd be like, what the hell did you just say that for? That was stupid. You can't do that. And it's like, uh, and... Every night, especially on the road, I'd be calling George in the room going, you gotta get me six beers on ice. I, RJ's mad at me. I gotta walk on the bus, hand him a bag of six beers on ice, and good job tonight, good job. It was like, but he just demanded it. And, and I, I, it was good for us, because it kept us on our toes, too. To... Yeah, he did. What about you? I mean, you, you knew RJ from your junior playing days, yeah, right, we, before we, here? We went back, uh, well, almost 60 years. And uh, when I started playing junior hockey in Niagara Falls for the Flyers, he was, that's when he started his play-by-play -play career. And, of course, our, our careers paralleled each other eventually. And uh, we both ended up here in Buffalo in the National Hockey League. But just to pick up on, on what we've been discussing here, I, I like to use the, the parallel when you look at all the great players who played in this league, uh, the, like the superstars, the Gretzky's, the Lemieux's, the Dominic Hasek's. Um, I put Rick in that category because those players made everybody better around them. And Rick did the same thing. And I was uh, interesting to hear the coaches say what an influence that he has had on the team because I thought it would just stay within the broadcast, uh, you know, like the producer, director, the analysts, uh, the cameraman. He made all of us better, but he also made the coaches better, and I, I thought that was uh, very, very interesting comments today. Yeah, you know what, it's funny. <laughs> Is the guys are saying, like, you know, Mayday was saying RJ got him a next contract. He got me like five next contracts, right? Like that was, and actually the Sabres got a second pick by trading me, and it was because RJ made me look so good. But he also got us to do so many crazy things. A couple of years back, we all dressed up in white wigs and mustache and, you know, but 
most of the crazy ideas, Jimmy. You're the one that had the, to feel it. You guys dressed up for Halloween. You guys did a lot of crazy things up there in the booth. Yeah. Like, were you ever shaking your heads and not again? Or because it was RJ, you guys did it? Oh, no, we, we, we just had such a great time. Uh, I mean, I was, I was so privileged to be able to, to work with, uh, with Rick uh, all those years. And uh, it, di it didn't matter. He'd come up with all these crazy ideas around Christmas. He'd wear one of, one of these ties that you'd punch, and it would play music and yep. sing a song and all this. And he thought it was great. But he, he was so full of enthusiasm that you couldn't help but, but get caught up in the moment and, and go along with whatever he wanted to do, even though it was maybe nuts to some people. But it always seemed to turn out the right way. <laughs> he hijacked pretty much every pregame show we ever worked on, right? Like, we would talk to producer Joe Pinter. Joe would usually ask, with about five minutes left before we're going on air, hey, RJ wants to know exactly what you're leading with off the top. And then that would allow him to go 180 degrees in a completely opposite direction. So anything we wanted to do went out the window, and we were all better for it, because then he just put everybody in a better place as soon as the lights went on. Still one of the best moments was when, Razor, you were there <laughs> sitting next to RJ in the pregame show. And RJ sat on his chair and pulled the cord from the uh, the console, so so he couldn't hear Duffer and I. And th you guys are live on the air, and RJ's like, I can't hear them. I don't know what they're saying. I can't hear them. And you couldn't stop laughing. You were crying, laughing on the air because RJ just marching to the beat of his own and, drum. And he'd be the first one to say, if you didn't know your mic was working, shut up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and he was just going on and on, and my mic was close enough taking it all in. But no, nah, you're, you're right. How many times, Jimmy, when you're in the box, and he would know, he knew when a moment was going to happen or where something happened and it was big, and all of a sudden he gave you the Heisman. Oh, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> and either let it go, let the, let the building breathe, let the, and then he filled in with what he wanted to say. So he controlled the box pretty well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was in com complete control of that. And I, and I remember we used to, uh, of course, we spent so much time uh, on the road together, uh, going out for a few beers, and uh, uh, and he very, as someone else mentioned, very soft-spoken, yeah. very unassuming, and we seldom talked about doing the job, uh, him as a play-by-play -play guy, me as an analyst, but one night we did get into a, a very light, brief discussion, and he gave me the best piece of advice uh, than anyone could give. And he told me, he said, look, Lorenzo, he said, if you don't have anything to say that's substantive during a stoppage of play or even during the play-by-play, -play, he says, don't say it. <laughs> just just shut yeah. up yeah. and just, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, and a lot of, I think, in broadcasting, when you first start, you get a little worried about dead air and you think you got to fill it. Well, you don't all the time. And that was the best piece of advice that anyone ever gave yeah, me. Yeah, that was, that was something. He said, you always don't have to fill all the time and let it breathe sometimes. And if something great happens, nobody wants to listen to you or I. They want to hear the building. They want to experience the building, what the fans are doing, the excitement in the building. And, you know, that was the first really two things he taught me when I sat down with him. And to always be entertaining. Yeah. You are there to entertain an audience for a couple of hours. So I'll share a story maybe I shouldn't share, and Rob's going to know. We did a preseason game, I think it was in um, Sault Ste. Marie in the States, or just over the border. Rob and I are talking about these preseason games, and sometimes there's some players on there that you're thinking, okay, are these guys going to be around, and how excited do we get about it? And then we're reminded with RJ, so you get excited about it. This is the Buffalo Sabres. So one thing he mentioned to us, and he was, I don't know if he was saying it to be fun or funny, but he says, hey, preseason when you're on radio, I think as Joe maybe mentioned, and it's been brought up before, nobody can see what you're seeing. So make it up. If it's a boring game, make it entertaining because they're listening to you. So I said to Rob, I thought, you know, when I come into the business and I'm thinking, especially nowadays, you guys talk about stats. Everyone's got tons of stats in front of them. Razor loves to grab mine and just throw them on the floor. But I'm thinking, I said to Rob, do we dare do this tonight? And I said, I'm, I'm going to do this. If, if a saber shoots and it's close enough to the net, I'm going to say that thing was as if it was on goal. And Marty made a great save. So I remember the moment in a game, there was a shot where the saber shot was really probably about five feet wide, but I called it like it was just off the post. 
I looked at Rob, and he's got a big smile on his face, and I'm looking at him thinking, you got to play along with me right now, because RJ said, this is how we're going to entertain the, the fans. Yeah. So The one thing, that's, though, that's That's the legacy he leaves with you in, in one way. He knew exactly how long to let it breathe and yeah. when to say something. I dare all of you to go back to listen to the Mayday call. Like, he gave just the perfect amount of time between the goals so that you could hear the horn a couple of times and then he comes in. Yeah. Anything longer would have been, well, you better say something, but he waited just enough yeah. to have that impact. Like, you can't teach that stuff. You have to, to be in there and do it for how long he did it and have the passion to do it. Um, so for every big calls, they are perfect. They are a perfect timing, a perfect tone, a perfect level of, of passion, um, the perfect words. So everything well, that he did was perfect. And is there another artist in our profession ever that will take what is normally a distress call of something going very wrong and turn it into maybe the best moment of his broadcast career? And for May Day, of course, too. I mean, that's the other marvel for me of, of RJ was that even if that went through my head, I'm thinking, I can't start screaming Mayday. I mean, <laughs> that means something's gone wrong here, but he <laughs> turned it into greatness. Jim, did you have a favorite moment in the booth with him or, and or uh, away from the rink, maybe a night where you were just enjoying time together on the road like you did countless times? No, there, there was just so many great calls. Uh, I, I, I still love the, 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 of course, the May Day call, and, and, uh, but a number of Dominic Hasek calls, like, oh, we are not worthy. Yeah. Oh. Also, uh, Jason Pominville, when he, when he scored uh, the goal against the Ottawa Senators, um, just so many memorable moments, and uh, I had so much respect for him. And, and as, as I mentioned before, uh, he had an incredible mind. Uh, he, used to, he, he used to make me so mad. I would try to do crossword puzzles, and he would, he would be on the airplane and doing crossword puzzles, and he'd, he would just knock them off, like one after the other, and uh, I used just to shake my head. And the other thing that I remember, um, when he was at CGRN, he was broadcasting Buffalo games and also doing CGRN radio, and he did a segment called One Man's Opinion. And I don't know if, if some of those One Man's Opinions are still available, but they were unbelievable. And he would, we would come in, or I would come into the broadcast booth on a home game, and we would be going on a road trip. And he would have to do four or five of these One Man Opinions. And they lasted 35 to 40 seconds, if I remember correctly. And when I heard, they were absolute pure poetry. And they weren't just on sports, they were on world affairs about any subject that you can imagine. And he was so right on with things. I, I, I was so envious of that, and I still am to this day. It's no wonder you made such a good partner with him, Razor. I taught him a lot when I got there. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, like, names. Like, names are difficult sometimes. And, you know, like before you look at the, the names, you go, how the heck do you say that name? And he goes, don't worry about it. Just say it the way I say it. And so you had to wait all the time for RJ to, to kind of pick up and say it, and then you did the same way because he'd get mad. But he, you know what? I just, RJ, for me, he taught me more about being a father, being a husband than anybody did, just through our time we spent and conversations. And, you know, I'd always like to try to get him going a little bit. And I always told him that you'd be nothing if it wasn't for us. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, if we weren't out there doing what we're doing, then you'd have nothing to talk about and you wouldn't have created greatness. He goes, look, I made you look good 41 times. You never got a nice goal in this league, but every goal you got, I made sound good. I'm like, you got me, you got me. Well, you want the pressure of one word to describe RJ? It's easy, perfect. I'm gonna give you two one words because the first one is genius, but Rob taught me this one and as I got to know RJ over the years, it really was true, generous. Yeah. Yeah. Razor? Yeah, I, I would just use friend. He was a great friend. 
I've used this word before, but he, he was brilliant. <laughs> Great words, gentlemen. Thank you. And we're so glad that not only are all those words so applicable, but uh, humor was such a huge part of everything RJ brought to the table as well. with Jim O'Lorenz. Hey, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Believe me, kids, uh, the Easter Bunny does not look like this. <laughs> but, but you do look sort of cute. I Thank want to you dance. very much. Yeah. Well, you're a better dancer, so you can. Oh, you want to do the Macarena? You well, I haven't got go time. I haven't got time. I've got to drop the puck, because otherwise I'd do it right now. It's been a rough night for <laughs> sheep and lamb. Whoa. Well, I always knew that you had gone to the dogs, and now I, now I know it for sure. Now, look at these babies right here. I told you the other night these were hot suspenders. These are the ones that my granddaughter, three yes. years old, made. They sparkle like they, they smile. They've got the sparkles. Watch out. I'll get a sparkle on you. Good, and then just do it a little bit faster. Hey, what do you want to wear tonight? I, I, I can only go so fast. <laughs> Are we all set to go, guys? I have just discovered, thanks to these people, a way for Rob Ray and RJ to lose weight. Who dance moves like that? We got it made, Razor. We got it made. Hey, what are you guys doing? Uh, what, nothing. Oh, no, nothing at all. Nothing. your ammo. Well, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to get out of the way, because RJ's got a gun in his hand shooting these T-shirts across. He put two of them on the ice, makes it all the way down there. We're trying to feed the people up here in the 300 level, and he's shooting T-shirts at the players and the no, referees. No, I'm, I'm giving it to the officials. They, they got kids, too, you know? Yeah, I don't know if they deserve it, though. The, given that this is March Madness time, another Another thing happened at this time of March, on this day, several hundred years ago. What was it? It was the Ides of March. Well, you're the only one alive that experienced that, so you're the kind of the guy that has to bring that history to us, RJ. We can't just expect us to read everything. I, this lady was hitting on me, and uh, I couldn't turn her down. I couldn't pass her up, and so I agreed to, well, you know, the thing is, she asked me to go out drinking after, and I said, no, and then she said, I'll buy, and I said, yeah. Yeah, baby, yeah, you're on. And now he's going to move over to the left-hand side. No, I don't like that. Now do you believe? Now do you believe? You I don't know how they expect us to figure out this new mobile ticketing app. What's this? A <laughs> I guess we're not using that right now. <laughs> I just did it. I might be the only time I get that right, and you just f***ed it up. It's so easy, even an old guy like you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he gave me a link. <laughs> Razor, would you agree? It's RJ, not Razor out there. Can't you see? <laughs> and why do you bother me twice in one night? Don't you think I got things to do? I gotta get down to the cookie tray before Hamilton and Harrington get there, because you ever seen around cookies? They're savages. <laughs> Hello, Santa. Well, wait a minute now. Before you call me Old Saint Nick, it's Old Saint Rick. <laughs> Duffert's not your fault for bothering me. You'd rather listen to yourself and Marty all night anyways. It's Pinto in the truck. He works me to death. He doesn't think I got anything to do. I gotta learn all these names every night right here. I could have done that. But I usually get more than that, though. You know, it's not just one. <laughs> It's at times like this that I'm reminded of one of my favorite movies. It's, it was back in the last century, though, called Field of Dreams. 
he says about this little town in Minnesota, and it could be any town, this is my most special place in the world, Ray. Once a place touches you like this, the wind never blows so cold again. You feel for it like it was your child. And that's how R.J. felt about Buffalo and how Buffalo felt about him. I, I'm just glad that I got to work in a booth adjacent to Rick all those years and laugh with him in the press room. Those words from Doc Emmerich were quite something nine days ago. Amidst that conversation that we had with him, he used the word approachable as a way to describe Rick. And I thought that was so fitting as well. Approachable, kind, diligent, caring, incredible. Those are five of the thousands and thousands of words we could use to describe RJ. He connected with everyone that he met, whether it was inside these arena walls or out. He made us all feel the same way. You know, young Tommy Prine wrote this in wake of his father, the legendary John Prine's passing. The lyrics go, when I'm standing by water, it's harder and harder. It's why I get sad when there's ships in the harbor, because they must be leaving soon, as they should. Well. RJ's ship docked here for more than 50 years, so how lucky are we? We will continue to celebrate RJ's Hall of Fame career throughout this upcoming season, and we thank all of you for being with us today, remembering RJ, the man behind the mic. This is the only job I ever wanted. And this is the only place I ever wanted to be. The minute that headset goes on, he's there. He sounds like he's 30 years old again. From my lips to your ears, thanks for listening. So how do I acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of people who have gone through the doors at the Odd and here at Key Bank Center? How do I acknowledge millions listening and watching over the last 51 years? I'll tell you how much I appreciate your beautiful noise. I have only three words, just three. I love you. They're going to say he was probably the most exciting, you know, play-by-play -play guy that, you know, that we've ever heard. Oh, what a save by Miller! Oh, you want to roll the highlight film? Baby, start rolling right now! He is, in so many ways, this franchise. Your name will hang in the rafters. Top shelf, of course. Shelf, where the ball hides the cookie! He'll live forever, because, you know, it'll be there. but your voice will echo forever. Thanks for traveling around with me on this road for the last half century. It's been a hell of a ride.